The crew of the Bradbury spacecraft, led by Alexa Brandt, decide to head for the planet Mars after nuclear war breaks out on Earth. The crew members soon begin to turn on one another, despite Brandt's attempts to convince them to come together under times of stress. The scene opens with a briefing of Bradbury Heavy Mission, as we see flashbacks and learn that environmental changes and political unrest have left Earth in ruins. As a result, a need for a new home arises. All systems are a go for the first human flight to the planet Mars and the start of colonization of the solar system. A large porthole is positioned over the center flight commander's seat. Until the Mars landing, it is sealed and covered to decrease radiation exposure. Flight Commander Alexa Brandt, Pilot Casey Donlan, Flight Engineer Ray Tanaka, Flight Surgeon Catherine Langford, and Mission Specialist Jerry Pearson are awaiting the launch of their spacecraft, the Bradbury. The first human flight to Mars. The final air-to-ground communication checks are conducted by Flight Commander Alexa Brandt and Pilot Casey Donlan. Flight Engineer Ray Tanaka monitors onboard fuel cells prepared for launch. Flight Surgeon Catherine Langford monitors the crew's vitals, while Mission Specialist Jerry Pearson awaits all systems are go. Their ship is monitored by the Onboard Transport Information Network Artificial Intelligence Unit called TINA. As they are ready to launch, Brandt asks TINA to play a song. The crew starts to sing along, but suddenly they get a very disruptive and surprising no-go signal. They get the news of the launch of five intercontinental ballistic nuclear missiles out of North Korea. Few minutes just before the launch, a North Korean missile attack has reportedly destroyed several American cities. It is estimated that the NASA launch bay is the target of one of the missiles. They don't have much time and they contemplate what to do. The crew all agree, except for Tanaka, to launch the ship in order to escape the incoming missile. They ultimately decide to launch the ship and race to reach Earth's escape velocity so they can evade the missile. Once they reach the planned trajectory, they set up communication to the ground and receive the news of the nuclear war. The USA was attacked, and in response, they attacked North Korea and Russia with nuclear missiles. Casey asked Jerry if they can remove the portal cover to have a look below. Jerry tells him that it was possible if they were to stay in low Earth's orbit, but as they are going to Mars, they will need the radiation cover to protect them from cosmic radiation. Brandt talks to her fellow astronauts and motivates them, stating how much they have sacrificed and what this mission meant to all of them. She then states that they have two options. They can either position the ship in low Earth orbit, but then they will eventually run out of fuel. They can't land either as the ship is designed for water landing and there will be no one to retrieve them from the ocean so they will drown upon landing. The other option is that they continue their journey to Mars and attempt to establish a human settlement despite all the challenges ahead. Jerry talks about the American economist Robin Hansen, which hypothesized the famous scientific concept known as the Great Filter. The Great Filter posits that life in the universe is very, very rare. It's hard to start and harder to continue. The test of life is, can an advanced life form make it to another planet before it destroys itself? They decide to continue their mission to Mars as they believe they are the only hope to save humanity and repopulate. The crew escapes Earth's atmosphere establishes artificial gravity, and begins the 230 day-long journey to Mars, assuming all human life on Earth has died in nuclear war. The crew all try to focus on their duties, but are distracted by the loss of their loved ones. Nineteen days pass in the spacecraft, and the crew occasionally tries to call home, but no one answers. Ray calls her mom's house, and the phone rings, but no one answers. Jerry explains that nuclear weapons generate a neutron burst that is effective in killing humans without damaging the infrastructure, meaning that the phone still works, but there is no one left to pick it up. As they are talking, Brant arrives, and she overhears this. She says that they need to accept what happened and move on. She instructs Tina to block soft phone calls to Earth without her permission. Another 10 days pass, and Ray and Cassie can be seen working out while Ray rethinks all the memories of Earth. Twenty more days pass and Jerry is working on some ship maintenance when he sees Tina taking a humanoid form in the computer for a split second. The next day, now 188 days remain till Bradbury Heavy reaches Mars. The crew is eating while Jerry and Casey talk about radio and shows especially relating to Martians and Martian invasion kind of sci-fi shows. Ray is still very upset when Casey asks her to pass him broccoli. She pays him no mind and ignores him completely, even when he calls out to her two or three times. When Ray does not respond, Catherine passes the broccoli to him and he thanks her. The group chats and shares views, but there is a little weirdness as all are not over what has happened. 
This makes Brant leave the table with her drink and go to her room. 23 more days pass, and now the journey of 155 more days is left. One night, we see Brant sneakily get to the cockpit. She calls her number and is sent to voicemail. She has called her own home, and voicemail is her own voice with the giggles of her daughter. After this, a message informs her that the voicemail box of the person you have called is full. This shows that she has been repetitively calling her own house, maybe in the hope that someone will pick up, or maybe to hear her daughter giggle again. Despite telling everyone to move on, she is still not moving on. Suddenly, she hears some strange sound, like someone knocking or thumping. She slowly gets up from her chair and walks towards the door from where the sound is coming. The window is all fogged up, and a hand suddenly thumps on the window and scares Brant. She slowly proceeds toward the door. She looks inside the mirror and is shocked to see Ray and Casey having sex. After watching this, she leaves, and Ray and Casey continue. The next morning, she chastises them because the ship cannot support any children, because of the limited food, oxygen, and other resources that this mission has. Casey apologizes and says that they have been really careful. Brandt, however, emphasizes again that the ship is not equipped to support additional crew. Jerry supports her claim that the ship's supplies are very estimated, and they have enough food for 3,200 calorie per person per day for five people. If Ray were to give birth and breastfeed, this would increase her calorie intake. Ray snaps at him that now he is worrying about her, but he didn't do it when choosing to doom them on this mission. 21 more days pass, and now 134 days remain of their journey. Brant is lying in her bed when she is approached by Catherine, who asks if she is okay. Catherine has lost her marriage for the sake of this mission. Brant says to her that she knows Michael. Catherine's husband wanted a divorce when she accepted this mission. Brant asks her if she regrets it. Catherine replies by saying, I had a choice between Mike and a round-trip ticket to Mars. I got neither. She then asks Brant about her nightmare. Brant tells her that she sometimes has dreams of her home in San Diego, blue skies, her whole family is there, and her daughter Natalie. Then, while dreaming, she realizes that this is just a dream she is not really there, and that's when she doesn't want to wake up and wishes to stay in her dream forever. But she wakes up nonetheless, and this is her nightmare. Catherine reassures her that she is not alone. They are her comrades, they are with her, they are her family, and she is their mom, and this family needs their mom. In a moment of weakness, Brant confesses that she may have doomed the crew to a slow suicide, stating, I'm the commander of nothing but a slow suicide. Fourteen more days pass, and now 115 days remain. Ray is sitting on her chair, and on her console mic, she is trying to send a message out to Earth. Jerry states how, as they get closer to Mars, messages take more time to travel to Earth. Casey approaches Ray and tells her to stop as Commander Brandt has given the order to send no more transmissions to Earth. But he says that what if someone answers them? What if someone is alive, and that he rather just have faith they're not all gone? It is when they start to hear voices on their radio, they get excited and hopeful and try to establish a contact, but are devastated to learn that it is nothing but an old television commercial whose signal was bouncing through space since the 70s which they just bumped into. The crew tries to cheer up Brant with a surprise birthday party complete with a makeshift cake and a sing-along of California Dreamin'. During the party, Jerry reveals that he has been researching their situation and has concluded that none of what has happened to them is real, one of the reasons being that he found no condensation on the ship, which would make it almost impossible if they were really flying through space. And weirdly enough, at that same moment, Tina warns of a dangerously powerful solar flare coming towards them. Jerry maintains that none of it is real, and just a test meant to test their crew morale and mental durability. The crew desperately tries to get Jerry to take his flight seat so the crew can deploy the heat shield. He refuses, and continues to rant that they are being watched in a six degrees of freedom simulation. When Jerry opens the airlock to prove his hypothesis, he sees the sun and is instantly gone. The crew decides to deploy the heat shield without Jerry. Later, the crew finds proof that Jerry was wrong in his assumption when Catherine shows the crew that she actually found condensation. The ship finally arrives and lands on the surface of Mars. The crew opens the main porthole that had been sealed for the entire mission and gazed out on a Martian landscape. But then the scene suddenly cuts to an unknown location. Mysterious alien beings watch the crew's actions. They discuss how they are impressed that the humans succeeded in reaching another planet though it took the destruction of their world to do so. Revealing that the aliens took several subjects and placed them in a superior simulation to test whether we are worthy and ready to pass, 
the Great Filter. It is also revealed that Jerry is alive, having been saved by the aliens. Jerry smiles as the aliens say that humanity is worthy of salvation and they are ready to make contact. That's it for today, guys. Did you like this story? For more stories like this, please like this video and subscribe to Recap Nest. Click on these two videos to watch more stories like this one. See you next time.